We all know the old proverb, you don't choose the stug life, the stug life chooses you. Well, in case you're one of the chosen ones, I got my hands on information for you. Namely from the Sturmgeschütz School Teaching Staff, a Sturmgeschütz Schule Lehrstab, which in October 1943 published a leaflet for the crews of the Sturmgeschütze. I looked at it and selected some crucial and interesting aspects for you. Now the crew of a Sturk consisted of four men, whereas most panzers had a crew of five men. Accordingly, the leaflet is structured along the different crew members, the commander, the gunner, the loader and the driver. So let's start with the instructions for the commander or Geschützführer, which literally means gun leader. One section is about combat versus tanks. It is noted that the prerequisite for engaging enemy tanks is knowledge about them, namely their vulnerable spots, technical specifications and characteristics. In case enemy tanks were detected, it was also crucial to report them via radio, yet also stay calm. Additionally, the leaflet states, Second, eyes everywhere, not only observe the foremost tanks, but right, left and even backward. Do not disregard tanks at a greater distance. The best method is always to let the enemy tanks run up to a lurking position at a good shooting distance and take them under fire. The Russian tank generally sees less well. Third, do not open fire too early from favorable positions. Effective distance is generally not more than 1000 meters. The rapid slash Flat trajectory gives a very favorable beaten zone. Accordingly, use the bracketing method, which is a method for adjusting fire properly. This underlines the use of the Sturg as an ambush vehicle at that point in time, for which it initially was not intended, as the name assault gun clearly indicates. The leaflet continues. Fourth, in a difficult situation, it depends who shoots first. Therefore, the whole crew must be able to work fast, but calm and confident. Technical advantages of the enemy, such as turning the turret, have to be replaced by smooth cooperation and intrepid operation. 5. Have confidence in your own weapon. In any case, the decisive factor are the spirit and skill of the crew and the performance of the gun. The Russian is defeated in most cases. Here is particularly interesting the German focus on skill and mental capabilities. This is strongly related to the German Army Regulation 300, Truppenführung, Unit Command, which contained the primary guidelines for the German army for the Second World War, in which it is noted, victory often is won by the stronger will. Another important aspect for the commander was Munitionstaktik or Ammo Tactics. It gives a short overview over the capabilities and limitations of the different shells. Save armor piercing shells for their real purpose. Panzergranate 39 for use at all distances. Panzergranate 40 Greater penetration power, but only for close distances. Do not use at distances over 800 meters if possible. Hollow charge, good penetration power and blasting effect against living targets, but long flight time and large dispersion. Smoke shell, as directing shots for blinding and setting houses on fire. Explosive shell, shoot with delay if possible. Good effect against living targets in areas or also for bunker busting. Mine effect in case of emergency, also has an effect against tanks, jamming of the turret. One aspect that is often forgotten and glossed over in popular discussions is the importance of communication and coordination. Their importance becomes rather apparent if we consider the following passage. Number one, every commander must see his honor in reporting much and well. He must always know that he is the most important reporting organ of the front line. Therefore, eagerness to report. Note that I stumbled across the word honor rarely in German instructions and manuals so far. Additionally, the precision of one speech is also crucial. Number two, the reports must be military accurate and absolutely reliable. Guesses and assumptions must be expressively designated as such. The commander is also reminded that he should keep the bigger picture in mind and report information that might be important to the leadership. There is an explicit reference to the so-called Auftragstaktik, which is usually translated as mission type tactics. For these, it is crucial that subordinate leader understands the commander's intent. So the why is central. Additionally, the superiors tell the subordinate leaders what to do, but provide quite a lot of leeway in how the objective is actually achieved. Number three, always try to report the essential according to the intent of the mission. 
What must the leadership know? What is of decisive importance for the success of the battle? There are more points, like reporting if the situation did not change, since this also allows the leadership to draw conclusions. Additionally, the commander is instructed to train his radio man in a way that in the heat of combat, he should be able to translate simple words from the commander into meaningful messages, which requires that the radio man possesses an understanding of the tactical situation. Furthermore, the commander must be able to handle the radio on his own. The commander must in any case be able to operate the radio himself. It is good if he can pass on important messages himself and receive important commands himself. He can thus talk to his platoon commander or battery commander, thus avoiding mistakes and saving valuable time. Let's move to the gunner who was also the second in command. One of his crucial tasks was to get the Stug combat ready. This meant getting the optics ready for use and also the gun. As you might have noticed from photos, the guns of tanks and assault guns are often fixed in place with travel locks during marches. The instructions note that completely removing the locking mechanism of the gun too early can misalign it and even damage the ball bearings. Now, during combat, the gunner was obviously responsible for aiming and firing. Now this process seems rather simple in computer games and yet also in historical footage, since we see professionals at work and the footage is usually from propaganda units. To give you a mere glimpse on how much coordination between the crew members was actually required, here are the basic steps. A. Let the cross level be adjusted roughly. B. Set the distance and type of projectile ordered by the commander on the attachment. C. Search for a target according to the commander's target address and aim for it. D. Have the cross level finely adjusted. E. Direct the target exactly again and give ready message to the commander. F. After fire of the commander and ready of the loader, press the trigger. G. When firing, keep an eye on the gunner side and observe the impact carefully. H. Side corrections after own observation. Adjust the distance correction according to the commander's specifications. Of course, this was according to the book. In combat, this might have been different. Yet particularly noteworthy is that the gunner should correct horizontally, whereas the commander corrected vertically. Also note that here it is already assumed that the driver aligned the Stuck properly. Next, let's look at the loader, who was also the handyman of the Stuck, which included being the radio man. We already mentioned the travel logs, yet something that is rather rarely known are the caps for protecting the barrel from dust and other particles. Every Stuck should have five of those caps in stock. It is noted that they could be shot through, yet with a few exceptions. If the gun barrel is frozen, do not fire explosive grenades. In case of hollow charge, always remove the muscle cap first. A quite funny note was that the cartridge pouch should not be used for garbage or bread. Furthermore, it seems that the plan on how to storage ammunition within the Stug was under the discretion of each commander. Place ammunition according to the plan determined by the commander. Armor-piercing shells always at hand. Only store armor-piercing shells in the ammunition box of the commander. Motor box. No hollow charge and explosive shells there. Danger of explosion. The loader was also responsible for informing the commander on how much ammo was left, since this was crucial for ammo tactics. Now during combat, the main job of the loader was of course loading the gun, but he was also responsible for defending the Sturg against anti-tank infantry. The loader must always be ready to fire anti-tank infantry with hand grenades and a submachine gun. Close combat weapons should therefore always be kept at hand. Similarly, he was also responsible for coordinating with the infantry. The loader must be constantly informed of the attack direction, target and infantry unit with which the assault guns cooperate. He must know the structure of the assault gun unit and the names of the platoon and assault gun commanders. He must be able to act as a radio operator in all events and incidents. Remember, unlike the Panzer's originally Sturm artillery, assault artillery was part of the artillery arm and the supporting arm of the infantry. Be sure to check out my video for the history of the German Sturm artillery here. Now let's look at the interesting tasks for the driver. 
Let's start with the starter, namely the electrical ignition system. A few weeks ago I released a video on my second channel about starting a Panther at Militrex 2019. And one person asked why they use the manual inertia starter and not the electrical one. Well one part of this might be for show, but we should not forget that Volvo 2 equipment was of quite different quality. And there are also operational hazards as well. The leaflet notes the following. Starting by inertia starter only in necessary cases with electric starter. Never with electric starter immediately after refueling. Danger of explosion. The whole rear armor can blow up. Similarly, the driver was instructed to drive next to the road if possible, to spare the running gear. Additionally, he should not turn in depressions and keep an eye out for the whole time. Channel Mud also gets an indirect mention in the instructions. In spring, take special care when passing from sunny to shady spots. In Russia, this often means an unexpected change in the composition of the soil. Frost dash mud. Since an assault gun has no turret, the driver job comes with more responsibility. Since he must position a chassis to allow the gunner to engage most targets. This is reflected especially by this point. In the case of unexpectedly appearing life threatening targets, anti tank guns or tanks, that are not detected in time by the commander. The driver will independently turn the assault gun in the target direction. Now when it comes to up close and personal combat, the driver similar to the loader also had to defend the Sturk. For close range defense he always carries a submachine gun at hand, with which he can also shoot out of the observation slit. Yet it doesn't stop here. He should also support the commander when attacking trenches in enemy positions. When rolling up trenches in enemy positions, he can use his submachine gun to effectively support the commander. Another key task for the driver was how he reacted to dealing when the Stuck was hit. If the Stuck was hit critically in a way that it was not suitable for combat anymore, aka a mission kill, but still able to move, he should deploy smoke and try to move the Stuck out of harm's way. If this was not possible, the Stuck should be left immediately yet also picking up small arms and ammunition. After leaving the Stuck, cover should be taken near the Stuck. Then it was crucial to observe if the Stuck was still fired upon. If not, and it was possible to approach the Stuck, it should be repaired and the battery commander should be informed. Note that the commander had similar instructions for abandoning the Stuck, yet with a different focus. If you're forced to bail out, don't forget your handguns. Muddle through as an infantryman. If the assault gun can no longer be saved, it must be blown up. Under no circumstances made fall intact into enemy hands, radio documents. Another issue were of course fires. And yes, the plural here is very important. Because the distinction between the different types of fires and the suggested course of action varied widely. Number 1. In the event of a carburetor fire, the loader must shut off the fuel supply, then turn the engine as high as possible to empty the carburetor. A fire on the bottom of the hull looks very bad at first. Keep calm. No immediate danger. Extinguish with a fire extinguisher, sand and water. Number 2. In case of fire caused by enemy action, switch off the engine immediately if possible if you don't have to take cover first. To prevent the fire from spreading quickly. Get out immediately and extinguish the fire. Number 3. If the cartridges have caught fire, there is no rescue. Disembark, run away. As you can see, the carburetor fire was portrayed as a very limited threat, whereas an ammunition fire was seen as fatal. Well, so if next time you're the chosen one for the Stuck life, you know what to do. So no more excuses, except for the I just followed orders one. Anyway, if you like well sourced content like this, consider supporting me. Source are in the description. Thank you for watching. And see you next time.